morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, talking about all the news and things that are happening in and around the city of Missoula and beyond. It's time for Wake Up Missoula time. So big news, Ted Kaczynski is dead. After years in prison, Ted K died at the age of 81. He was found in his cell, and some speculate that it, was an apparent, it could have been a suicide. For years, from the 70s to the mid-90s, Ted uh, Media coined him as the Unabomber, and uh, after forcing U.S. News to publish his manifesto, um, um, his brother noticed similarities with his writing and tipped off the FBI, which led to his arrest. A uh, big part of Montana history, he moved to Lincoln, where he lived in a shack with no amenities and got his own, uh, got it in his own head, resulting in a focus on modernism being the enemy of man, hence hated the idea of an ever-evolving tech sector of the world. Ted Kaczynski uh, created a following much like many serial killers throughout tabloids and pieces made on him. They even made a movie about him star starring Sharp Lowe Copley, uh, South African from the District 9 movie. This was a very uh, scary chapter in American history where people were afraid to open their mail as he used the U.S. Uh, Postal Service to mail bombs to various people, killing some and maiming others. On one hand, he became a stern warning of where the world was going and on the other hand was so afraid of modernization that he took his law into his own hands. This is kind of what, uh, you know, it's it's definitely related to mental health issues for sure and there's just a lot of uh, curving and I've spoken on this many different times on my morning show talking about some of the op-ed pieces about how like mental health services in the state of Montana are very lacking and that's uh, being a big issue in terms of what's happening with the urban camping problem that's happening in the city of Missoula. So budget community of the whole uh, they were talking about all these meetings and some of the money that they're going to be allocating for this not to mention they put in an emergency uh, tax uh, emergency uh, bond mill levy so the city has the ability to uh, put a state of emergency from the urban camping and because of that they were able to uh, mill in two levies to a total of about a half a million dollars which would effectively charge uh, citizens or residents of Missoula ten dollars uh, each for the property taxes. Emergency money is something that cities uh, sometimes have, but the mayor and members of the council have spent a majority of time uh, blaming state government for ignoring the mental health crisis and shakeups at the West, at, at Warm Streams Mental Health Center didn't help as well. And so far, this city introduced this emergency lil levy um, for the growing urban camping site. So the whole idea behind this is that the brass tax will essentially be charged as $10 each and will generate upwards of half a million dollars to reopen the Johnson Street shelter and provide shelter services continuing for the next year. So, you know, I've said it before and it bears repeating, Missoula is enjoying a large federal aid because of the pandemic, but the feeding tube was pulled some uh, and some of the folks who were dependent on these services, even if they uh, were low serviced authorized campsites, they were still a place for people to go. Um, coming from the mindset of the city, authorized campsites are good, but the liability from folks being assaulted, trafficked in some cases, or, or rampant drug use prevents them from using Pavarella services, which has very simple but hard to maintain rules for high risk individuals. What does it necessarily mean for higher risks? Drugs, alcohol, and you know, simply not showing up during scheduled hours. You know, they had a very uh, strict schedule for people who got into the system if they were lucky enough to get into the system, because uh, as of right now, those services are being uh, squandered for uh, a group of people, but there's still a larger uh, group of area that the services just don't provide because that's not how much money uh, was meant for that kind of stuff. So the local homeless shelter is a, a dry shelter and in the past many citizens wanted to have a shelter for those who uh, were kicked out or banned from the facilities but were still in the legal system. Um, the, over the course of the series of meetings and on uh, back basically back in 2018 this is when the city of Missoula decided to actually be like, okay, we should probably uh, get people off the street during the winter time because of hypothermia and a lot of visits to the hospital as a result. And so they uh, dished in about $50,000 a year for that Johnson Street warming shelter just to happen for the winter. And then the pandemic broke out. A lot of people left their ho lost their homes. You know, the eviction moratorium was lifted over the last year or so. And just a lot of things just kind of started trickling down and one of the many um, saving graces during this pandemic trying to find people to find places was uh, United Way of Missoula with Hope Rescue Ch uh, Mission basically creating their shelter which is called the Temporary Safe Outdoor Space and by that they were able to, uh, get pe to try to get people from the uh, Reserve Street encampment so with a little bit of the good there was still a little bit of the bad while basically 
with Montana Department of Transportation, in, in conjunction with the County of Missoula, they created a, a barrier, a fence along Reserve Street to prevent people from camping in those sites. You know, they uh, basically use the uh, health uh, department as a uh, reasoning behind clearing out some of the things. Like, well, we got to keep it over clean. It's in our constitution, clean and healthy environment. And then they use that. So it, it was interesting how a lot of the laws and rules and regulations were twisted to kind of accommodate, you know, just a certain status quo within the city. And then, you know, one thing led to another uh, as, you know, because we were fairly money rich, you know, the, you know, we were able to open what was called the authorized campsite. And that was next to the uh, water treatment plant on the other side of the river where it can be serviced and maintained. Then that was closed because they knew that the money was going away. They, you know, they were very hopeful and to, that they could provide services to the people who are at those authorized campsites as they were transitioning to the emergency winter shelter, which is like the only place they can go. A lot of them were already kicked out of the Pavarella for this or that. And so there's just a lot of moving parts with this particular thing. And so the money ran out and the closure of the authorized campsite, then in turn the emergency winter shelter, which was only funded until the end of, um, I wanna say, March. A, a, oh yeah, end of March, early April, sometime around there where they're transitioning out of the emergency winter shelter. You know, when you establish a site for camping, that does not mean that the city is liable for the folks on the property. You know, think about the kid playing on your lawn kind of situations. Like if you're opening a campsite and you just expect people to go there and there's incidents that happen, it's like you're basically creating a uh, turnkey liability of happenings so there's it's interesting for sure there's there's a lot of back and forth and there's a lot of people you know can't come into city council and public comment saying that it's like oh there's a lot it's a lot simpler no 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 it's it's individual case by case scenario between people um you know at the you know in many cases the diff uh, the difficulties of some of these people require the boots they need to pick themselves up uh, from their bootstraps rather than expecting them to straighten up and fly right. In some cases I've heard some are perfectly fine with just living on the street because it had become their normal. So, you know, that's some of the things that are happening. The city of Missoula is trying to move forward with trying to uh, use some of the money just to reopen the Johnson Street shelter. It's not gonna ultimately solve all the issues because there was already encampments kind of growing off of the POV regardless of the emergency winter shelter. So it's just something that is tr hopefully trying to curve it for the tourist season as some of the public comment uh, mentioned uh, in uh, critique of the city's mo motion to basically remove uh, people from the city county park systems from uh, 11 p.m. to about 5 a.m. So no overnight camping, you, you just can't be in those sites for the desert for those particular times it's it's i don't know i'm kind of going off but anyways um another big celebrity that we just recently had uh in missoula is ken burns he showed off some of his work here in missoula's woman theater for an upcoming docuseries about bison so this was actually news last friday but i missed it because i didn't know he was even here in the first place i was wondering why there was such a huge line uh, going so far from the Wilma Theater all the way down to pretty much just kind of shoehorn around a whole entire block, almost going downhill towards Karis Park. So it's kind of like a whole block face. It's kind of ridiculous. But the streets were packed. Uh, Ken Burns is a prolific, uh, prolific documentarian so much uh, so that uh, Final Cut Pro, the editing software that I use, has what's called a Ken Burns effect, which does a scan over a photo in slow motion and which was heavily used through his uh, Civil War documentary released in the 90s. And of course, 90s kids can agree that the Civil War documentary was extremely boring. Uh, the documentary is about history surrounding the culling of the uh, bison population by settlers in an attempt to tame the West. Uh, Jermaine White of the Salish Kootenai tribes and uh, Rosalind Lapierre of the Blackfeet Nation were consulted and used to help paint the picture of the white man during their shared histories. Ken Burns shows no favoritism when painting a picture of history from the best and worst of humanity to educate and prevent these th real things from occurring and learning from history, warts and all. The uh, docu-series is called The American Buffalo, which were released in October 16th and 17th in this two-part series. Um, Ken Burns has also stated that this is actually a third-part series in which the third part would be what happens in the end, in which uh, he says that it'll be long past for future generations to uh, make the third part of his uh, three-part documentary. So this is interesting because unlike other states, uh, Let's see, uh, let's see. Oh, actually, this is an interesting uh, story as 
also because we're talking about in the environment and stuff like that. Missoula Public, uh, Montana Public Radio published a story about a bunch of Montana youth suing the state for not living up to the state's constitution for a healthy and livable climate. This is interesting because unlike other states, this lawsuit it has merit in conjunction with the state constitution written in 1972 for a healthy livable climate in the Montana. Monday, the teens from around the state had their day in court. State Attorney General uh, Austin Knutson office made several attempts to get the youth climate uh, lawsuit thrown out, but has so far failed. The Attorney General and uh, conservative lawmakers state that the kids are being uh, co coached into suing, the, suing by the legal team and or their parents. This will be ongoing for the next week or so. And according to some, uh, so another story that picked this story up was the New York Times. Judge Kathy Steely spoke during Monday's hearing at the Lewis and Clark County Courthouse up in Helena. Montana's warming climate will have uh, cascading environmental and economic impacts, according to Roger Sullivan, a, a lawyer for the youth residents, said it in an opening statement. This has also has to do with Montana's drought and extreme weather incidents from flooding near Yellowstone that caused a collapse in a historic canyon road. Judge Seeley has been open to recent scientific reports on climate, while defendants have objected to this during the opening parts of this case. MCAT actually got a call this week for uh, having us cover this court proceedings. You know, I forced them over to uh, Helena Civic TV to uh, for potential coverage, so this is a Interesting thing that's happening as of right now, it's ongoing. Uh, it's going to be happening for another week as they present their arguments to uh, Judge Seeley. Um, another big news item that was released that this week was the re resurrection of John Lennon. Former Beatle using AI in collaboration with surviving members Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. This was inspired by Get Back, the documentary Peter Jackson used raw footage from Let It Be documentary and repurposed it to bring new, more nuance into the final collaboration of the Beatles before John and Paul broke up the band. This will reuse already existing audio from John along with the using AI tools to create what will be known as the last Beatles album yet again. But before, of course, uh, before Landon was murdered, there were talks about coming together for another album. Get it? Come together. Um, Ringo Starr's sole album, Sentimental Journey, after the breakup was probably the closest thing to a reunion because it had collaboration between John and Paul as well. The album geared more towards the trends in music that era rather than innovative music that they have created as a sum total. Uh, you know, this is kind of a big deal uh, since many popular albums involve Paul and John's collaboration. Um, another story of uh, what's also going on this week, because, you know, it's one of the big news that's happening is that uh, President, uh, a former President Donald Trump saw him show up in court in Miami as a result of an indictment involving those classified documents that were raided by Mar, that was an FBI raid uh, at his Mar-a-Lago mansion. This was weird because many of these parallels between Biden's documents and VP Mike Pence essentially getting a slap on the wrist made many people back the former president because in a lot of ways it, like, controversy only seems to only make him even more popular. So you got to look at some of the things with that. And the case will have to prove that if Trump knew about the documents and how he handled the documents and must prove without a reasonable doubt that he knowingly kept the documents against orders to return, that's something this case will follow. You know, they talked about the Espionage Act, uh, the former and sitting president, the main difference will be negligence and determining malice intent. Uh, but the big political landscape will get twisted to the idea of classified documents in those three situations from Biden, Trump, and Pence. Tuesday's federal court plead not guilty on Tuesday. This is just one of the many things that Trump's dealing with right now. It's too easy to draw those lines, but one thing is clear. Trump will continue this case, the sexual assault case, the hush money case involving Stormy Daniels and former lawyer Michael Cohen's as their star witness in terms of Sto Stormy Daniels. Um, not to mention the DA out of New York is looking into his business dealings to do with the fact that he uh, potentially embezzled money from his um, uh, nonprofit uh, fundraising organization. So there are a lot of few uh, many over things uh, overshadowing Trump during his campaign. And uh, if this was anyone else, it would fairly be an open and shut case. But this is a high profile defendant. The process will be long and Trump aims to get in the Oval Office for a chance to pardon himself, according to skeptics. So, yeah, that's I, I, I want to avoid as many politics as I possibly can. But it's kind of a big deal when a former president gets indicted for a second time. So that's kind of what's happening in and around. Uh, what's also happening in and around in the city of Missoula is the uh, Missoula City Band. So I brought in Gary Gillette to talk a little bit more about it. Let's take it away.
Wednesday. Oh, this Wednesday. Is it this Wednesday? The, uh, the pre-show. Yes, your pre-show, yes. which you started doing after you retired. Yes, yes. And yes. you started doing this. It's like the dual gig band, right? Yep. And you guys perform. It's a nice way to kick off the summer series and add a nice bonus concert for those uh, who vote. For the for the public and also what it does is buy me an extra week of rehearsal with the Missoula City Band. Yes. Because we really, we could use several rehearsals. When the old man had the band, they would start rehearsing in May, and I could never do that because I was teaching. Uh, and uh, I don't want that many rehearsals. I <laughs> and when, you have, when you're a seasoned professional like uh, me and Gary, we don't necessarily need rehearsals. Yes, no, well, we just need rehearsals. But I usually show up for rehearsals to show solidarity to the other players, That's especially true. the trombones. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's well, some brain damage out there. I'm probably the, uh, the quiet trombone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, well, in comparison to the people on the outside, yes, indeed. Oh my gosh! So it's a it's a little gift, and o- though we uh, 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 could use weeks and weeks and weeks of rehearsal, we just get two. And so you put the Missoula Big Band, who are just dying yeah. all the time, wanting to play. They drive me freaking crazy. Uh, yeah, they play around town uh, year, year round. It's not just. Uh, the it was city supposed band. to just be the, the, you know the winter. Then in the in the summer, I have the city band because I don't want. I don't want to feel like I'm working. Good Lord, I did that. I did that enough. Though the people argue that teaching is not working. I'd like to talk to you, sucker. Uh, <laughs> it was a great way to almost make a living. Uh, but back to the, the to the deal at hand here. So the city band starts up this Wednesday and every Wednesday. The biggest, the biggest change, the biggest. Notice I have to get out. Do you know what this is, Scott? Is that there something to do with the International Choir Festival? That, that, no, that's not the biggest, but yes, okay. indeed. <laughs> it's we're pretty doing, big. We're, do, we're doing that thing again. <laughs> we've done we've done every one. We are instead of having a <laughs> guest choir sing individually, we're doing a big all combined number with all the choirs. Oh. They are all going to come up. We have a special wow. arrangement. Uh, that we're all going to do together. So it's not only just the uh, without Missoula's, a rehearsal. <laughs> there's no time for a rehearsal with them. We're going to rehearse, and then I'll rehearse with them. Uh, but the the only time we yeah. do it together will be in public. And I, I mean, since it's like the culmination of all the choirs, <laughs> yeah. they will probably most likely not need to be mic'd. That's right. Yeah. Because right. you know, the, you only need like five band members to blow out like the, the, 20 no, choir people. You got it. But this is a, a <laughs> Don Yarmillo. Our, tr- our trumpet player, he knows how to write f- for uh, voices as well. So our, our band part has been specifically written to slim down the band and give several hundred voices wow. a chance to be heard. And when is this happening? Yeah, somehow in the teens of July. Yes. That sounds right. Yeah. All right. Usually, but that's, no, you, that's usually kind of in the middle of yeah. all these concert series. Not yeah. to mention, you do the ones with the uh, band camp at the University of Montana. Don't you usually have? Yeah, they usually come issue? down and, and catch it. Used to be a bigger deal, but then COVID came and we yeah. lost that connection. And I'm trying to think the, the dates don't line up as well. They would always come down. The kiddos would have dinner there, then go to the to the Dairy Queen. No, but you still haven't guessed the biggest news for this year. Oh. Um, are you going to dress up as some kind of conductor man and uh, do a John Philip Sousa one-man show? No, 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 no. Though I am consulting with the Great Falls Band that, that, that is doing that this year. Nope. For the first time in 130 years, we pushed back the starting time. That's Ooh. right. We got ready. We got people ready. We had discussions for ye- <laughs> years. <laughs> and then last year, we took surveys for both our audience and our members, and every, very, the, it, it, a handful of people said, I don't know, I kind of like it the way it is, because we're afraid we're going to lose some folks. They're going to show up halfway through the concert if what's going to happen. Now, how many times are they going to do that until they come a half hour earlier, or they say, well, the heck with it, they're not going to start at the right time on staying home. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, to answer your question, in 130 years, <laughs> you decided to change the start time by half an hour. <laughs> so instead of 8 o'clock... <laughs> Like you normally do, now you're doing at 7.30 where you're doing the concert yep. every Wednesday at Bonner Park. We, we, it, we, we keep on talking about everything but the specific times in which these start. So those are the specifics. That's it. It's kicking what off time? Uh, 7.30 there you go, every buddy. Wednesday which means you for need nine to weeks. <laughs> it's not the regular eight weeks because you have the kickoff. That's right. Yep. And, uh, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff that the city band does. It's very consistent with the summer. It's one of the, one of the longest-running 
like city kind of type band program for forever. Yes, yes. It's yeah. certainly the longest running here in town and probably in the state. And there are some bands on the East Coast that, that started sooner, but because, yeah. uh, you know, the, it will be all summer long and with a host of wonderful guests, almost always singers. We start the year out with Ellen Peterson, Ooh. who is Dorothy and Dean's girl. She sung a couple of times with us, Star Spangled Banner, or just tidbit things, and I, I booked her for the for the. the and then you always opening. give uh, you, you always give your audio guy a chance to. Play I always with give us. Jay a chance to play. Now he's got a sling. He's had rotator cuff surgery, so we're gonna need some help falling speakers. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, but uh, I always open the door and try to get Jay because we're going to do a tribute to Elvis. This nice. Year, uh, be- because we lost a clarinet player this year, Kathy Cooper, third clarinet player. And I had no idea that she was an Elvis fan. Mm. And now Al- she's younger than me. I don't know what she was doing being an Elvis fan, you know, it was before she was born. But she had, and uh, we'll do an Elvis gig for That's her. That's awesome. Well, tell the people at home where they can find out more information, you know, social media, your website. We do, we do this. We have a website, too, uh, MissoulaCityBand.org, mm-hmm. uh, or we're on Facebook, whatever. You, so you just look up Missoula City Band, and I guess that's the most current, that there are um, weekly uh, posts and information and what we're going to play on the concert and all that stuff. So, Well, I'm excited for the concert. I'll be there, too. For God bless a majority you. of it, for sure. God bless you. Yeah. Boy, that's why I really came down here, to get him on tape and make the <laughs> commitment. You heard it here first. He just grabs me and pulls me <laughs> up the city band. He's <laughs> like, oh, no, 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 no I have to work. No, you don't. No. It's either drink tea or come on down to the city <laughs> band. <laughs> don't out me like that. <laughs> and, uh, T-boy. Yeah. T-bone, T-boy. Yeah, it all makes sense. It's it all connected. It certainly does. Hey, see the city band. Welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. We're kicking things off. It's time for pre-critic way, pre-judged movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases to just movies in general. So let's kick things off with The Flash. Jumping into one of the biggest stories in Flash history, the one where he travels back in time and saves his mother only to create a sonic time boom that just ruins everything uh, around him. Uh, watch that as the famous people redeem themselves with a great performance, but in this world, Ezra Miller plays two annoying speedsters who clearly need Vyvanse or something as they grip with the reality of a changing world where Batman gets a second chance with Michael Keaton. Which, frankly, you know, the millennials and Gen Xers will be all like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to totally see this movie now. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, you know, I guess, pe- you know, anyways... Tom Cruise says this movie is a master. Tom Cruise says this movie is a masterpiece. So we all know, you know, we I gotta believe him. Uh, then we got a Pixar movie that's coming out this weekend. It kind of came out of nowhere, but I, I've seen some advertising from it. It's like a water guy and a fire girl. So they, these can't be a couple. They become a couple. Blah, blah blah. Enjoy this allegory for immigration. We have yet another Disney Pixar movie that asks the questions: What if this random thing in this? Uh, um, let's see. Uh, this was in love with this, yeah, movie. And yeah, basically that's what Pixar has kind of always done is put, uh, give life to inanimate objects and they give them a story. So turn this forbidden love story between mixing elements. I assume things will work out bec- between Waterboy and Fire Girl. And they'll have uh, steam children and also hot water or cold flames. Uh, thus, uh, Shaq will come out and dust his icy hot commercial to complete the circle that has been growing between Disney and um, yeah, making all that kind of stuff. Um, sorry, I thought I heard something. Thus, come out and do his Icy Hot commercial and making money in which they will go, can use their properties rather than the original ideas because of this is the original idea. Of, ugh, sorry, I'm just thrown off track and everything like that. But anyways, you know, don't expect to watch another Zootopia from this movie. Um, finally, we have a video game because there's not that many movies that are coming out this weekend. Aliens. Uh, game is here to make you think make you do things while not being uh, probed or attacked by little gray men. Join a first-person shooter horror game that's basically being destroyed by critics left and right. Hey, you know, I love aliens. Who, who doesn't love aliens? But enjoy a series of plots where you basically get thrown into the 90s and you're basically uh, hunting aliens or trying to do tasks while aliens hunt you. I don't know. It's pretty unclear what this game is really about. It's mostly like those kind of Five Nights at Freddy's horror type games that those kids are obsessed with these days. And that about does it for your pre-critic. Up next we have a brand new dub and stuff from the 1942 uh, movie The Falcon Takes Over. Uh, what? Who could that be at this hour? I'm coming, I'm coming. Ugh. 
No. Hello there, brother. Hey, Vanessa, can we talk? Um, no, thank I'm you. not asking for money this time, I promise. I guess you can come in. You are a family, after all. You seem a little shady. I know it's late, you probably want to keep it down. I mean, between the debts, collectors and the police. Well, you don't have to worry about the phone calls anymore. Oh, I don't, do I? Perhaps this is just another investment opportunity. I know I've made things tough for you, but I gotta tell you something. This business with the uh, rubber bands over bouquet of flowers have been very lucrative. Rubber bands can be used for more things than just bouquet of flowers, you know that, right? Well, not everyone has a vase now, do they? Well, with the money that we saved from all these vases, we bought this house. And apparently, you only bought your clothes. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> well, some people invest in houses, stocks, and all sorts of things. You invest in the way you look. Well, anyways, I gotta go feed mm -hmm. my cat. Okay. Oh, hello there. Ouch. Oh, the good kitty. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, that's good interesting. Good Please tell me more about your cat. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, she's extra fluffy. Uh-huh. Oh, and she does this thing where she lays on her back and wants you to pet her belly. Oh, I am definitely petting my cat right now. Ow! It bit me because I touched her stomach. What a trap. So, anyways, I just uh, gave my cat a treat. And, yes, I know that I don't have a door to the living room. I like curtains. Huh, you want to guess what I found under your old bed? Well, am I turning red? Well, don't they seem a little young to be looking at anyways? Well, um... You disgust me. Well, you know, the thing is, is like, you know, pictures don't age. I just happen to age. Well, well, you've stayed the same most of your life. Maybe you've changed your clothes and appearance and whatnot. I've upgraded from Arizona tea to mm, kombucha. Okay. What do you say about that? Oh, does kombucha hey, make you grown up? Don't make fun of my kombucha. I'm not going to assault you with this bottle, but if you get anywhere near me and this bottle hits you, it's your fault. You know, I might be your little brother, but I ain't little. Now, now, put that thing down before you hurt yourself. I know my way around a bottle. Don't you judge me. I'm just trying to reconnect with family. Huh. At this age? Are you kidding me? The only time you ever reconnect with your family is when you Is it so off the something. wall that I want to get close to you again? You're my sister. We're well, family. Well, maybe I was a little bit harsh. Well, it is a bad horoscope month for you. Would you like to have a drink or something? Maybe some kombucha? I don't have any Arizona tea, sweet ugh, tea. tea is terrible. Uh, don't you, uh, me? Uh, you're always so quick to anger, aren't you? I'll be taking my leave. You can keep my pictures. Oh, yeah. Kombucha's overrated. Ah! Huh. Huh. And you call me the little brother? Come on, now. I'm calling Mom and Dad. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some city council. As we're diving right in, um, uh, Missoula swore in the new police chief, Mike Collier, in this meeting on Monday. Um, he'll bring more than 20 years of your police experience department. We'll have a little bit of snippet, uh, snippet from him as well moving forward. Jumping into the latest comments since the mayor pulled out the emergency tax he put on Missoula residents. Bob Carl's resident is not happy about the uh, new taxes um, associated with this emergency uh, no levy. Most of these people are not Missoula homeless. They are transients. They come here to live off us. They choose to live off us. They don't want to work. If you will look at their age, they're all 20s and 30s. They are not looking for jobs. They put their name, their picture and, and stuff on the front page, but the reporters never ask them, are you looking for a job or do you want one? Because there are plenty of them. You see the people on the corner panhandling they are all in their 20s and 30s. And it's getting, the Mozilla has become an cesspool. They are contacting other people in Seattle and Portland, and it's gonna keep pouring in. It's not a, it's a crisis here, yes, but not humanitarian. I agree, you can't do anything about criminalizing the uh, camping, but you can the other crimes. There's vandalizing, there's littering, there's, urinating and defecating in public, there's alcohol, drugs, assaults, 
there's all kinds of things that can be enforced that would be against the taxpaying public. And it's not being done. And this is just inviting them here. And it's it's got to come to a head sometime. Okay. So, you know, it's the whole idea of if you build them, if you create the services, they will come. And that's just one of the many uh, concerns that, that uh, Bob Carl, citizen of Missoula, is concerned about. He's one of the folks who's concerned Missoula services are putting a stranglehold on residents struggling already to support groups of people he believes to be unhelpable. On the other hand, one resident, Ellie Harrison, remains hopeful for the potential future for what Missoula is doing in terms of uh, serving uh, the unhoused. Missoula's future belongs to those with vision. As Theodore Roosevelt said best, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. Thank you for being in the arena. I know you've all received a lot of criticism, but you don't receive enough encouragement. I've come today to say thank you. I believe it's time to stop cursing the darkness and instead to light a candle. Missoula stands at a great crossroads today. While in some ways we are indeed in a state of emergency, we are also on the precipice of finding the most innovative solutions to the most challenging problems we face. And together, putting divisions aside, I believe love will prevail. I believe there's a tidal wave of compassion about to flood Missoula, and all of us are a part of that. Thank you for being the answer that we need. Okay. A lot of times the city doesn't get as much props as uh, they get criticism, but that was uh, one of them. And, uh, you know, it went on for some time during the top of the show, and it's, you know, very complicated when you have folks coming here with a promise of stability that simply is not just not provided within the city of Missoula. It's expensive to live here, and you don't get paid much for entry-level work unless you have a golden ticket of a job waiting for you. Even, you know, the most well put together I've met moved to Missoula or back to Missoula with very little idea of how hard or expensive making rent or paying mortgage if you bought a home after 2020. Uh, Jordan Hess talks about the emergency level uh, levy in response uh, to uh, some of the concerns of Missoula. Several weeks ago, um, I asked our staff to start working on plans to open a year-round shelter, and this is a result of that. Um, I also want to thank, um, there's been significant council interest. I know there's some referrals in on this. Um, I know that it's been a conversation that you all have been having with your constituents and with um, with service providers. Um, I want to thank all of you for that, and I look forward to the continued discussions. I also want to thank um, the Missoula um, County United Way and the and the um, service provider partners who provided a letter to all of us today. Um, and I want to um, acknowledge the good work with uh, a couple hundred people signing onto that letter and asking us to, um, to take this step among others. Um, we need to continue to work to identify funding sources, or we needed to identify funding sources. We believe we've, we've gotten to a position where we have um, a suite of funding sources that allow us to open um, an emergency shelter um, and uh, uh, inside of about 90 days. Uh, the Pavarello Center Board of Directors approved that action on Friday morning, and um, we're uh, moving forward with them, and um, we'll continue to uh, keep you all posted. The emergency declaration has to come to council for ratification, um, so we'll work to get that scheduled. Um, of course, we need to keep our eye on the long-term goals of, of housing and um, a permanent second shelter in the community. Okay, and so that was uh, Jordan Hess's response. Uh, to what's happening in the city of Missoula in terms of what they're doing with the urban camping and more. Another the big move is the city's doing uh, to remove uh, removal of some of the bus stops. Uh, this was based on the number of folks using the stops and trying to maximize timing in routes inbound and outbound from the downtown Missoula. So they did a major overhaul like 10 years ago, and now they're doing another update to kind of reflect that. Andrew Richardson, Andrew Richards residents respond to some of the changes, and he is concerned that the one bus stop would potentially create a uh, liability for the city of Missoula. We moved the bus stop that was at Parkview Way and High Park Way at that junction and made, moved it to Whitaker. Okay, that's fine. However, there's no <laughs> pedestrian pathway on High Park Way. If it's like this, someone's gonna get injured. I mean, it's fine, you do it in June. What about January? There's no lights, there's ice, 
there's snow. It's really a safety issue. It could be your parents walking there. It could be your children. All ages use this bus stop. And to see them remove it, it would not have a pedestrian walkway. It's really going to cause an accident. And I'd really ask um, anyone that's interested, come meet me. Let's meet up. I'll, I'll walk that road with you. And you can see if that's safe or not to have the public walk in there on the bus stop. All right. So that's uh, one of the comments. You know, that's just one of the main things that happens within the city of Missoula is that they, you know, do surveys, they do traffic studies, and they determine whether or not some stops are even usable or unusable. And many stops along the university have been diminished as well as over surveys conducted in like Route 10. If you remember Route 10, that used to go up all the way up Mullen Road. And that was a big part of the Smurfit Stone uh, transit uh, part of that. And then as we were transitioning out of that, you know, there's still a couple hardcore people who still use the Route 10. But that was one of the more um, sad uh, routes that had to be this diminished just because it was such an out of the way trip for a lot of uh, mountain line buses to go to in the first place. And so that, I, you know, not to bring up some old like controversy of that one too as well, but this is uh, just one of the things that, you know, transportation infrastructure, which, you know, led to, led, that kind of led to the free model that we live today is that they did an overhaul of the system. We we're able to conduct that ridership was improving and the free ridership made it only better and now they're just trying to update and fix the wheel a little bit further so mike kohler is now the uh, city of missoula police chief and uh, mayor hess talks a little bit more about his induction into becoming the uh, the chief of police in the city of missoula chief collier was uh, has been with the missoula police department for a number of years um, he grew up here in missoula and attended the university of montana along with north idaho college where he received a degree in law enforcement and he's been um, he started out at the coeur d'alene police department but he's been here in missoula since 1996 uh, in the missoula police department he started out as a patrol officer and worked his way up through the department holding a number of roles and uh, gaining really intimate familiarity with the department he was a motorcycle officer in the traffic unit and the field training officer uh, and then he was promoted to sergeant in 2001 where he supervised uniform patrol teams the traffic unit and the street crimes unit he was promoted again to lieutenant in 2008 and he served in the office of professional standards at, where he was responsible for citizen complaint investigation internal investigations recruiting and new officer hiring in 2011 he graduated from the fbi national academy and was later that year was promoted to captain and was assigned to the detective division. He led the work uh, that um, guided the Missoula Police Department uh, with the U.S. Department of Justice to reform MPD's response to sexual assault and um, was uh, in that division until he was transferred over to, uh, to, the, uh, to serve as the administrative captain where he oversaw the Office of Professional Standards, the Property and Evidence Unit, the Records Unit, the Police, the police Support Specialists, and the Training Program. A pretty long uh, list there for sure. And uh, let's hear it from Mike Collier himself, who Just is being with one. To be here and um, humbled at the faith that you showed me to lead our department. They do great things every day, as all of you know, and to have the opportunity to, to support and lead all of them um, is is quite an opportunity i say all of them because i think oftentimes you know we see on the news and in the media and they make movies about what the cops do the badges do but we have reserve officers we have non-sworn people in the field we have non-sworn people in the department and all of them collectively make the work happen and so um i i am going to make a point to myself here moving forward to recognize all the members of our team so uh, speaking of team, I, I never set out to be the police chief. I, you know, as a new cop, I thought walking in, if the biggest accomplishment I could make would be to be the badge number on the briefing board. When other officers walked in, they were happy to see me as part of the team. Thought if I could get that done in a career, that's a successful career. And so I've carried that forward. And, you know, as a sergeant, I wanted to be part of that team. And as a lieutenant, I wanted to be part of that team. And now I kind of find myself I want to be part of this team with with council. I want to be the, the the name on the lineup that you guys see as part of the part of the working group, and you're happy with that, and be a team team member with all of our department heads. So again, thank you so much for for all of the faith that you put in me, and I couldn't be here tonight without the support of my family and 
past and current leadership within the city police department. I appreciate everything that they've done to help nudge me along this far. So thank you. Okay, so you. you'll be taking the uh, reins as city police chief. Um, yeah, let's, let's see. Um, you know, he'll replace Jason White, who took over for Mike Brady during the earlier parts of the pandemic. Um, one of the topics uh, the city spoke about in length was the Sapphire Place Annex, which will be a, a rent-only development near the Mullen area. Mullen area. There's a lot of ambition with this site, and I won't bore you with the fine details, but all you really need to know that they're using more than um, thir uh, 39 lots to create a 301-unit complex with a lot of green space involved with that as well. So public safety and health spoke more about the emergency ordinance that the city declared last week and will take details during this meeting. The presentation spoke about the plans to work with other communities across the nation and dealing with the very real capacity issues that we're dealing with today. Emily Armstrong talks about the flexible programs being included in this shelter and these are the models that have been going on since the uh, full um, um, all hands on deck for Operation Shelter, which included the city and county. So this is what Emily had to say. We intend always to create a continuum of options that creates uh, services that can wrap around any person who loses their housing, regardless of their unique circumstances. Um, and as our program offerings and our shelter offerings in Missoula shift in time, we update this, this graphic and update our um, conception of what this continuum can look like. At one point, this continuum included the Sleepy Inn, which was a non-congregate shelter that saved lives for folks who were unsheltered during COVID-19. It provided a safe quarantine location. It was FEMA funded and the sale of that property will go towards the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. At one point, it incorporated the authorized camping site, now closed as a super low barrier option to meet the needs of many of our neighbors who we see camping unsheltered today all right so you know if you can actually see the graphic a little bit better you know you can see how it kind of uh, goes up in a certain kind of deal and, you know they have different tiers for different people and they're just trying to find a uh, basically a diverse uh, way of getting people into ho housing in general regardless of the barriers that they may reach um, as it stands the shelter system at, is the Pavarella and as the main point of entry for folks wanting to get into shelter but not everyone can get along with a service provider Emily talks about the one point $2 million going towards reopening the Johnson Street shelter, and this is what she had to say about that. So our primary short-term action so far has been um, developing the plan to reopen the Johnson Street Community Center for year-round operation of shelter services. Um, we've been working with the City County Health Department and with um, community leaders across the community to understand what's needed to make that possible that's something we haven't done before and then actualize that put those steps into action so before you in the budget cycle um, you will find a new request for one million dollars two hundred and seven one million two hundred seventy nine thousand one hundred sixty seven dollars which is sixty percent of the total amount needed to reopen that shelter the total amount is two million one hundred thirty one nine hundred forty five it is just simply expensive to operate a shelter we talked with numerous shelters and a shelter in Spokane and without any prompting they told us their budget was two million dollars so we're on par with similar operations in other communities um, all right so yeah there's a there's a lot of money that goes into these shelters uh, just in general um, operation shelter like I mentioned before it was the joint effort between the city and county create shelter space and maintain it further a big chunk of these efforts is to put public partnerships where with places like United Way of Missoula, Hope, uh, Sovereign Hope Rescue Church, others organizations, the uh, mobile support team that deals with uh, mental health crises. This emergency budget will only be for a year of Johnson Street shelter reopening. Short-term issues is a uh, health department needs to uh, clean space and access to toilets, wash stations, and renovations of this space before it can be operated up to a certain code. This will buy the city a year to figure out something for coming up with a budget that would reflect the need. Trinity Navigation gets an update on services provided as well because that seemed to be like one of the big pushes towards um, more permanent housing for people. So they're going to talk a little bit more about the Tr Trinity Navigation Center that just opened just this past March. The Resource Center is, um, we're really excited that All Nations is 
is willing and interested to provide services there, we know that our unhoused population, our neighbors who don't have houses or who ha are housing insecure, are disproportionately Native American. Um, in our most recent data, it's, it was about 20% of our houseless neighbors compared to, I think it's 2% of our local population, 1.5%, um, which is a, a massive difference. So we're really excited that they're willing to offer those services and can provide culturally appropriate care for our neighbors who need it, as well as for anyone who's interested in accessing services. And they're going to be utilizing all a nation's health center as a uh, main point of entry for people to get their medical care that they need, especially those who have Medicare care related towards uh, their roots in uh, the tribal and the reservation ser systems. Um, so um, let's see, let me go back to my notes. Um, the biggest challenges overhauling the system is services. You can build a box, but the city can't simply open a building and provide a roof without staff to steward the site and the people. Grants are not, uh, you know, annually guaranteed, and that money is usually used for creating something, uh, creating something, and not necessarily maintaining it. Aaron Pian, a CPI, uh, talks about the reality behind simply allowing for camping in designated areas. So she addresses it a little bit more on that regard. I would concur with Emily. I, I think these are fantastic ideas. You know, the first bullet point talks about long-term transitional community with tiny homes or shelters and assigned campsites. That's essentially describing the temporary safe outdoor space program, which is, is an, um, a tremendous program providing an incredible service in our community. We would love to double or triple that. It would be great to have five temporary safe outdoor Give it a second. Or space programs. We don't have the funding or the provider capacity to run those within the city right now. Um, similarly, looking at creating 30 additional units of permanent supportive housing similar to those that are coming online through the Trinity uh, development. We, we would love to do that 20 times over. We don't have the low-income housing tax credits to create those right now, nor the vouchers to run those at the federal level. And so we, we, we can continue to explore those, the barriers that we faced in either scaling up programs like temporary safe outdoor space or getting more permanent affordable housing units that require a federal housing voucher and a state uh, housing tax credit. Um, those aren't barriers that at the local level we have been able to solve for. Um, so I, I don't know that our research uh, would change dramatically in the short term, but they are things that we're continuing to work with our local provider leaders, our state coalitions and federal advocacy groups on creating more resources in those areas. Um, but it's not something we have the, we have the power to tackle or solve um, on our- Yeah, so that was uh, just, one of the many difficulties that they're trying to figure out, trying to do and trying to uh, spread and try to stretch out the kind of funding that they already have, not to mention in addition to this extra money, just to see what they can do. So it's the old state money is uh, lacking and federal programs are geared towards best laid practices to get the grant money. Um, and then during public comment, uh, Kevin Hunt, who's been speaking very passionately about this particular topic, talks about losing people's trust in this uh, tax, um, emergency tax uh, levy. You, we're declaring a humanitarian crisis and yet we're doing business as usual. The 10 year plan is done, it's dead, and it was a failure, okay? We have to do something different. Um, we, and, and you know, I don't think you're gonna, I, it barely passed in the city last time. I don't think a levy is gonna pass th this next time. I think that, again, your political capital is just about done. And to follow up on what Councillor Jordan said, um, you should try to avoid increasing property taxes. And I would suggest that since this problem is a blight on the city, that the entire city be declared in blight and that um, uh, funds that uh, are beyond debt service from MRA be used to fund all of these things. Um, and because MRA has the ability to extend the life of the current urban renewal districts out to what, 40 years or whatever, in order to service bond, bonded indebtedness, this shouldn't be a problem. All right, so uh, also going back to what uh, public comment Kevin Hunt was mentioning as well, um, 
One of Kevin's suggestions was to tap the governor to enact a state of emergency to create barracks to provide shelters that can be quickly made and used by folks. There was a lot more from Kevin Hunt, and he's been a regular at these meetings talking about this. And um, God, what was I thinking of? Sorry, you know, when you think of something, and then you just kind of lose that end of thought. But um, I'll, I'll get back to it if it comes to mind. But Kevin Farmer, resident near Johnson Street, you know, pretty much on the grounds, talks about some of the uh, personal touch um, of the area and talking about what the city should try to strive to do. Johnson Street shelter not permanently or not spoken of permanently as of yet that is our concern within this neighborhood and to talk about the crime i'm not going to give a bunch of examples if you want to look up 911 logs feel free but i see a disconnect between talking about providing housing and, and what you had mentioned as some um, research that you still need to find as to what people want and from what we're seeing in our wards and I hate to be so glib about it, these individuals are not demonstrating that they want anything. And I know, and that's the perception. So it's a matter of like, and that's why I said in my earlier statement, involvement from the mayor's office directly on the ground and with the Pavarello, because when this center first went in, in the very first winter, we had reached out to Pavar the Pavarello Center directly and were met with basically ignoring because of either being overwhelmed or complacency within the job. And to the point of the night security, I agree with Mr. Carlino's statement that those were very alarming things and being prior military myself, that what I would look to is potentially a sheriff's deputy program, funding and within that sheriff's deputy program, volunteer program, possibly extra funds within a <clears throat> Missoula Police Department overtime, that's a little taxing, and that's where we start spreading the taxing around, et cetera. But my point to my comment right now is that if we are moving forward in this direction, I am not hearing a lot from the city nor from the Pavarello that they are in fact concerned about our concerns. Because when they are, when these individuals leave this facility, and that's why I pointed to the Ninth Circuit Court, which is where we're at because of this. And when we talk about Austin and we talk about other cities, I think that there is a cowed and somewhat scared approach where it's going to take creativity and bravery on the part of council as well as these other groups that you're working with to say what can we do within the confines of that what legal precedents can we set at a local level and specifically to when the shelter is closed for the time being where are these people wander and i hate to use that expression these people but with the individuals that we're speaking of where they wander and what they get into and in terms of like personal impact, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with my details, but clearly you can tell by me being here, I'm in representation of a small quadrant of people. And there is a large neighborhood within the different wards that all intersect. And I'm not hearing a lot that's going on. And that's where a lot of people right now for, I'll just say ticked off, is an understatement. All right. So that was Kevin Farmer who is a former resident of Portland and has uh, stated that the dignity of a few and the patchwork done have resulted in many homelessness issues within their community. And that doesn't even uh, cover decriminalization of drugs. And so far the city came up with the reopening of Johnson Street Shelter and continues to do patchwork on an issue that is very expensive. And if you can solve homelessness without spending money, then feel free to prevent to present this to the city council on Mondays. The city will provide 60% of the funds and the county will, pro uh, will provide 40% of this emergency ordinance. And the direct impact is reopening the emergency winter shelter for a year. Um, you know, it's the easiest short-term solution that the city have, and that's what they're going to be doing. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund has received $1.7 million to invest in advancing the city's housing goals. This is a scope of the project that may, might interest in the money that aims to have larger impacts with the least amount of money for other projects. So far, United Way of Missoula has created a rent program uh, to benefit those who qualify to stay in their homes rather than go through uh, the homeless system. That is just a giant wait list for many. So far, the programs in uh, place relate to finding permanent solutions towards new affordable housing opportunities and retention in rental as prices go up. These are the centralized housing solutions, which provides $100,000 in the pot for rental relief for partnership with United Way. 
and then and the one to start the TOSOS, uh, the temporary safe outdoor space, designated campsite during the pandemic. And I've mentioned NeighborWorks before, our large real estate companies like BlackRock and Carlisle Group, you know, the whole uh, water trial drama. They've been known to buy up land properties and resell it at crazy during this crazy expensive market. NeighborWorks allows residents of trailer parks to buy their land right from under them to retain their standard of living. They spoke about rent going up always and paying a mortgage is better at building equity rather than renting and dealing with recent proper, uh, personal property taxes, which uh, uh, County Commissioner Josh Lonick says that people should sue the state for this uh, unfair tax. So personal property tax. So uh, that's one, this is during the pandemic when some of the things were uh, housing, uh, where cars actually went up in value and you know, trailers much like um, cars, once they leave the lot, they basically decrease in value. You can s resell them, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, unless the property that the the structure is on is worth something, then that's what it, that, then who knows. But this has been the time for a lot of people to be like, oh, I'm selling out. I'm, I'm getting out while the getting's good. And so that's what a lot of the people who own these trailer parks have done. NeighborWorks, the nonprofit organization, basically rallied the residents together to be like, hey, you know, you want to stay here, right? It's like, yeah, of course. I don't want to just wheel my house to the outskirts of town and just try to figure it out. And so one of the things that they ended up doing is try to pull the people together, get in contact with them and be like, hey, you know, you know you're going to pay extra rent regardless or you're going to have to move. But if you buy the property as a lump sum with the help of NeighborWorks with some federal funding and uh, affordable housing trust fund money, you're able to buy a house. So essentially your $400 a month, some people pay $600 a month for the trailer. They'd have to bump up to $8,000 a month, but they would go towards purchasing it. But if they were keeping the trailer park and the rental units, they would end up paying more than double for their rent just for that kind of stuff. And that was based on many presentations that NeighborWorks have done for it. Homeward was also mentioned as they provide a nonprofit angle for first time home buyers and affordable housing units that they also manage. There's also uh, new items being brought forward, but they wanted to make it clear that this money would only be approved and used by the board with staff services from the city of Missoula to steer the ship. Essentially, Missoula is filling in a lot of the holes even though it feels like more holes are popping up over time. But like potholes, the city does not see all the potholes and requires some real input from the community. We're in this together, even though some of us would rather be left alone. So anyways, up next, we have another tease from the uh, last best constitution. This one uh, has um, the first lady of lawyer in uh, Diana Dowling with host Evan Barrett of Helena Civic TV talking a little bit more about uh, uh, did the you Constitution. Bring along the thing that went to the voters. Oh, the newspaper. Yeah. I did. Oh, okay, good. Let's bring that out, but we won't get to that quite yet, but let's get it out here because that was an important function of that committee, and you were the center of that very important piece of work. I wrote it. There you go. There you go. And went to Billings and oversaw the printing of it, and it was mailed to every voter. You know, you look at that thing, it's pretty amazing. We'll talk about that because as soon as, as you guys had approved, uh, done all of the uh, committee reports and then you smoothed them all out and made them one voice, uh, uh, they were, uh, all were acted upon. They didn't all get 100% of the votes. And then you had a document, a singular document that had to be presented to the, the whole convention again. It's all written up. And in that document, uh, they had to decide whether they would sign it or not. They didn't actually cast a vote. They cast a vote by signing it. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. 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 I looked. I went to journals to find a vote that said, I hereby vote for the Constitution, complete and total. And there is no such vote. They just they all They simply up called the roll and said, if you want to come forth and sign this Constitution, you may do it. All right. So, yeah, I mean, the Constitution and like most constitutions are not voted in favor of. It's like you sign it to be a part of the Constitution, thereby swearing upon those guidelines for the future of what 
you think the state should be in terms of that governing body as a whole. So it's very interesting. There's a lot of great programs in regards to that. I don't have much time for my morning show. I do want to say a couple things before I wrap it. It is Pride Weekend this weekend here in the city of Missoula. Enjoy some Pride festivities. There's a lot of drag shows, there's a lot of comedy, a lot of fun. There's a parade that's happening Saturday at 1 p.m. and it's going to be happening from up around 3rd Street on the, uh, on the hip strip going to gather there and they're going to be marching down up until Main Street where they're going to have a block party baby and so there's definitely a lot of stuff going on here as well and we're going to be wrapping up our uh, Saturday drop-ins for our stop animation uh, by the end of June. I'm just going to give you a notice of that and then of course we have the farmers markets happening every single uh, Saturday from around 8 a.m. to about 2 1 p.m. or so or stuff like that. There's usually a wide gap and you know some people close a little bit earlier so the best times I believe is between 10 and uh, 12 seems to be, but they also have to be, happen to be the really peak time for a lot of people to come down. So I would probably say 9 to 10 if you want to avoid some good amount of people. But for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I know I will.